would be the host of the store. Before we get started, please turn off your cell phone or switch to silent mode. Thank you. What is your New Year's resolution? Mine is reading a book every two weeks. That's why a big advantage of being a jazz member is borrowing books from the jazz library. 5,000 books are available and also we have various genres too. Today, let's raise for who is assistant professor at Gwangju Women's University who will introduce several book stories, including History of the Dutch speaking peoples between 55 to 1648. Which is the first, which is the first book she read in Jesse Library. At the end of Je at the end of Jesse talk, she will be handing out a list of her favorite ten books available at the Jesse Library. Without any hesitation, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Beth with a big round of applause. As Invit introduced me, my name is Lex, and I am a professor at Gwangju Women's University. I have lived in South Korea for 11 years, and I have been in Gwangju for one year. And moving to Gwangju was especially good for me because I learned about the GIC and the GIC library. Um, I am a very avid reader, and when I first came here, um, as it said, um, I came across this book in the library upstairs, The History of the Dutch Speaking People, it's 1555 through 1648. Um, this book was especially interesting to me because I constantly crave intellectual stimulation. And in coming to the GIC over the weeks, I met Dr. Shin. And Dr. Shin, from time to time, would ask me about what books I was reading, which books I thought were interesting. And I would talk to him, and I would say, oh, there go, oh, this book. This book is so interesting. It's a story about, hmm, 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 hmm. Oh, really? Really? Oh, tell me about another book. Well, there's this book, and um, this is what's happening in this book, and oh, it's, it's very much like this other book. Um, and so it was really at the suggestion of Dr. Shin that I come here today and um, talk about some of the books that I've read um, that are available to all of us here through the GIC library. Um, so, first I would like to thank Dr. Shin. I would also like to thank Joey, who is a coordinator here at the GIC, as well as a woman named Karina. Um, and all the volunteers who have brought some of these books together. So, um, let's, let's begin by talking about some of the phenomenal nonfiction books in the GIC library. The first book that I would like to tell you about is um, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, I've put these books here in no particular order. Um, they're all very interesting. One is not better than the others. This book is especially interesting because um, it's a story about a woman who had a cancer in the 1950s. She was poor, she was black, she had no money, she had five children, and she had a very, very intense cancer. And the doctors took part of the cancer out of her body, and it continued to live after she died. Her cells did not die. 
And it is because of her and because of her cancer that researchers were able to come up with a vaccine for polio. All current research done in every research laboratory in Korea is based on this woman's cancer cells. No one knew who she was until this researcher, Rebecca Skloot, spent 10 years of her life trying to find whose cells HeLa cells belong to. It's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting book, and I have to apologize. I have a very, very um, serious cold today, and um, meant I accidentally left many of my notes at home. So I don't have the exact years. But what's interesting about this book is that um, her family was never told that her cells were taken. And her family never received any money. And multinational corporations have made millions and millions and millions of dollars selling her cells around the world for research. It's a very good kind of detective story, trying to find this woman and who she is. Another great book, The Know-It-All, by A.J. Jacobs. This is more of comedy. This is the story of a man who wants to know everything. And so he reads the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> cover to cover, <laughs> from A to Z in one year. And um, it's, more, it's more his own personal memoir of his experience and his personal challenge, trying to learn all of this information and keep to his schedule of reading. I like his ambition, because it reminds me of the gusto of many of my Korean friends. When they take a hobby, they really want to do it. This man really wants to know it all. It's a very interesting book for anyone who loves just reading and enjoying information. It's a fantastic book. The next book that I would like to talk about is The Man Who Would Be King, the first American in Afghanistan. I believe that this man, this man was from Pennsylvania in the United States, and in 1820, he had a girlfriend who broke his heart. And he did not want to stay in the small town where he grew up because the village was very small and he did not want to see this woman again. So he took a boat to England and when he was in England, he joined the English Navy and he sailed to India and he decided he did not want to be part of the English Navy. So he walked into the mountains, through Pakistan, and into Afghanistan, and he became the first American national in Afghanistan. And he found that he had a talent for languages, and he learned various dialects of Pashto, the language in this particular area, and he disguised himself as a Muslim. And over the course of 20 years, he became a king, a legitimate king of Afghanistan. And he was the king of Afghanistan for about a week before the British came in and took the territory as a colony. He was a warlord, and um, he had the entire 
country of Afghanistan under his control. Most people didn't know he was an American. Most people didn't know that he could speak English. He was a Christian Quaker from Pennsylvania, disguised as a Muslim Afghan. He left Afghanistan when the British toppled his government, went back to Pennsylvania, had no place in his community, no one understood him, no one could relate to him. He moved to San Francisco and he died in 1870. Incredibly interesting book. <clears throat> True story. This book has only been written recently because his journals have only been found recently. And it's all based on his personal journals. It's very excellent work. This writer, um, Ben McIntyre, he is famous and has made a name for himself with the books that he's written about World War II. He is an excellent writer. Um, this book is very easy to follow. Um, and a very, very interesting um, because it gives a foreigner's perspective on Afghan culture in the 1700s. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of foreigner you are. I believe everyone in this room is a foreigner of, to Afghan, Afghanistan. <laughs> so just from any outside perspective, um, it's very interesting in terms of food and going to the bathroom and medical facilities and people getting pregnant and transportation. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm going to say that about every book. They're all interesting. <clears throat> this book is one of the most fascinating books I have read about Korea since I've been in Korea. This is a true story. All of these books are true stories because they're nonfiction. In 1994, there was a man, Colin Thomas, who was an English teacher in Seoul, and he went on a vacation to the Philippines. When he was in the Philippines, he met a drug dealer, and he arranged to have drugs smuggled into South Korea through the mail system. Um, the Philippines don't have especially tough drug laws, but Korea does. And this man had his drugs mailed to him in Seoul. He was caught by the police. He spent four years in a prison in Wijongbu. And what's interesting about this book is it talks about his perspective as a foreigner in a Korean prison where he was, he was very young and he was very arrogant and he felt that he did nothing wrong. And he found himself in this situation where he was given no status and no privilege, but he is still incredibly arrogant. It is a fascinating book. Um, and I've never been to prison in South Korea, <laughs> but I'm curious about it. Um, reading this book was especially interesting because when he's talking about his, his conditions and the weather and the heat of the summer and the coldness of the winter, he doesn't have um, glass on his windows in his prison cell. So in the winter, his room is very cold. And in the summer, his room is very hot. And he's with a lot of other prisoners. Um, and he learns Korean. And eventually, he gets out of prison and he goes back to America and this is 1997, he's very embarrassed when he meets Koreans in America because his Korean is fluent. And they ask him, oh my god, how, 
you're speaking Korean. How do you know Korean? Because in 1997, there weren't a lot of foreigners who could speak Korean. It was a very unusual situation. I'm not going to tell you how the book ends. <laughs> you have to read it. That's really good. I read this book very recently. Actually, I purchased this book and I donated it to the GIC library. Um, there's research happening all around the world, all the time, on subjects that we never think about. I want to know what that research is. I want to know what people are studying in universities. This woman, Alexander Horowitz, has spent the last 20 years researching dog behavior. Okay, it doesn't sound interesting, but usually people think of dogs and even cats and some animals as lesser versions of people with similar experiences, but we can use these dogs out here as an example. Okay. <laughs> these dogs are blind. I think everyone here knows these dogs. These dogs are blind. That's actually not a problem for dogs, because in the last 20 years, researchers have discovered that dogs have very poor vision. Even dogs who hunt birds, they're not actually seeing the birds. They're just seeing movement. But the most fascinating thing from this book is the way that dogs' brains are structured around smell. If I'm in an apartment building and it's a sunny day, and maybe I'm on the sixth floor, and I can see down the street, and I'm looking down one block, two block, three block, four blocks, and I see my cousin, and my cousin is walking to my house, and I'm in my apartment, and I'm looking. If the, if the weather is good, I can see my cousin four blocks away. If the weather is good, dogs can smell four blocks away. Sometimes they can smell five blocks away. If your dog knows that you're coming home, it's usually because they can smell you on a good day. Um, this book talks about the experience of life as a dog compared to the experience of life as a person. If you have a dog, if you know a dog, if you like animals, this book will be incredibly interesting to you because dogs are not like people at all. <clears throat> what they can touch, what they can taste, what they can smell and hear is very, very different than our own experiences. Oh, my favorite book. I love prisons. <laughs> it's true. I love prisons. I love, no. <laughs> I love reading about prisons. <laughs> I love history, and I love reading about people's experiences of survival. I love reading about people's experiences of facing challenges that are completely out of their control. I love the human spirit and how people survive.
I love reading about how people can build communities in terrible situations and terrible circumstances. Between, forgive me with the numbers, between 1923 and 1957, the Soviet government under Stalin murdered 20 million people. I believe that this is the largest concentrated government killing of its own population in recorded history. This book is comprised of over 227 personal accounts of survivors of the Russian prison system between 1923 and 1957. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I can't say his name ever. <laughs> um, he personally served in a Russian prison camp for 11 years. So as a person in solidarity with other experiencers, he was able to write this book. Um, he won a Nobel Prize for writing this book in 1970. And um, one, of the, one of the most pressing things about this book is that um, most of the people who were imprisoned, tortured, and murdered were arrested with no grounds, for no reason, in terms of breaking the law. One of the main reasons why so many people were imprisoned was to populate the less populated parts of Russia, which would then give the Soviet Union more credence internationally in terms of uh, maintaining such a vast, vast, vast part of the planet. This book is also in Korean. I've seen it at Kyobo Bookstore. I've purchased it from many of my friends. It's the best book I've ever read in my life. I read this book this week. This book is written about the life of the only known survivor of a North Korean prison camp who was born in a North Korean prison camp. Again, I'm very interested in prisons, I'm very interested in labor camps, I'm very interested in the human spirit of survival. Um, this man, um, I don't, I don't have the dates, but he was born in Camp 14, um, and he lived in this camp until he was approximately 24. Um, he escaped, and this is his story of his travels through North Korea into China, into Seoul, from Seoul to the United States, and it follows his life. Um, the most impacting, most impacting thing about reading this book for me was um, that I picked this book up about two weeks ago here at the library and I walked right out here and I caught the bus home and um, as I was standing there and reading this book I wasn't wearing gloves and it was right after the snow there was still snow on the ground and this prison 
and 20 or 30 other prisons just like this in North Korea still exist. And I was standing at the bus stop without my gloves, reading this book. And there are thousands of people, five hours north of us, who are experiencing the exact same weather without gloves, without coats, without socks, sometimes without shoes, without heat, without water, and without food. And that's a five-hour car ride from Guangzhou. I can read about the Gulag Archipelago. I can read about the Holocaust. I can read about the American prisoner of war camps for the Japanese in California, Oregon, Idaho, and Washington during World War II. But this one is still continuing. And it's continuing just north of us. And when I feel the cold in my hands, I'm thinking about these people. They're still there. Which is a good transition into a fantastic book about 10 years of research on emotional vulnerability. I know many people have, no, there are many people in the world who are familiar with this author. Her name is Brene Brown, and she is the, reading, the leading researcher in vulnerability. And she gave a phenomenal TED Talk last year, which really, really changed the way that people are thinking about vulnerability and thinking about relating to one another. Um, there's not a lot I want to say about this book other than it's amazing. And that you should check out her TED Talk um, before you read this book. The TED Talk is just as good as the book. Growing up in America, when I was when I was 10 years old, my mom helped me learn about human sexuality by having me read this book, Our Bodies, Ourselves. It's pretty standard reading for most American women. Um, when you start to get your period, when your body changes, you want to know what's happening. Um, and so usually, to learn about human sexuality, parents have their daughters read this book. Um, which was fantastic to learn about my own body, but through my entire life, I had never learned anything about male sexuality. So, I'm an adult now, I can read whatever I want to, I'm going to go to the GIC and pick up the very awkward book, and yes, that's right, I'm checking out this one, right? Um, but sometimes you have to stop being embarrassed about life and start learning. <laughs> uh, so, um, education never hurts anyone. Uh, <laughs> right. um, I'm not going to talk about this book, but I think you should read it. <laughs> And, um, don't let's go to the dogs tonight. One of my favorite countries is Rhodesia, because it doesn't exist anymore. Like prisons, I'm also very interested in learning about failed states. 
you will not find Rhodesia on the map. It doesn't exist anymore. But it was a British colony in Southeast Africa in the 1960s and 1970s. And this is the memoir of a woman who, a white woman who was raised in Rhodesia on a white farm with white racist parents who wanted Africa to be a white continent. This woman grows up um, with a lot of guns and a lot of alcohol and a very huge family farm, which the government eventually takes away from her family and her family becomes homeless and very alcoholic and three of her four siblings die. And it's an especially important book for many people to read because very often an outside perspective of Africa is that it is a continent only with black people living there. Having traveled extensively through Africa, I know for a fact that Africa is full of many people. And there are many different African stories. This is a story about a white family in Africa, in a failed state, and how this daughter came through her racist family to work against racism in Southeast Africa. Interesting book. Those are my top 10 favorite books that I've read in the GIC library. There are more than 5,000 books in our library system here. Those are 10 that I thought were especially good. Quickly, I'm just going to show you a few more books that are interesting. I've never been addicted to crystal meth, but how's that for a segue? <laughs> um, this guy was. I don't know what it's like to live with drug addiction. I've never been addicted to drugs. But I'm interested in reading about it because it's part of the human condition. Um, and this young man comes from a very wealthy family, goes to university, brilliant, smart, <coughs> tries crystal meth, winds up living on the streets of San Francisco. He's a male prostitute, sells everything he has, breaks into houses, steals things, has a very, 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 very difficult life. And um, this is his book about how he goes through recovery and the process of what it feels like to be a drug addict. Like being in a work camp, something I hope I'll never experience. Herodotus, the histories, where are you? Right. Oh, man, gotta love this. Herodotus is called the father of history because although there were many written accounts of history before this was published, I believe, in 420 BCE, um, this is one of the fullest historical documents in the history of humanity. Um, really quickly, I thought it was especially interesting for the parts where he talks about the history of Egypt. That's my thing. <laughs> I don't know what more to say about this one. It's just so good. Um, it's just, you know, it's super soft spot. Um, I have a degree in Islamic studies, so um, one of my favorite books, it's the Quran. Um, the version of the Quran that we have here in the GIC library is the Penguin Classics. 
I can't recommend this. And so um, you have a, a handout of, of books. And on there, I just wanted to point out that if you're interested in reading the Quran in English, you'll want to go and you'll want to look at the Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation. That's the translation that is most highly regarded in academic circles. And um, don't read anything else. If you're going to read the Quran in Korean, please contact the mosque in Itaewon. They have a fantastic bookstore with so many wonderful books about Islam in Korean. I'm not a Muslim, but I highly suggest anyone who cares about people and the world and interesting things to study Islam, because there's a lot that we all need to learn about each other. And I highly recommend anyone to read that Billy Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran. Cambodian Civil War. Again, very interesting. Prison work camps, a family survival. Another book I'm not going to talk about too much, but this is an academic, um, this is an academic, this is a book of academic research trying to find accurate statistics on adultery in every country around the world. Um, I found it to be a very interesting topic. Um, and so um, the name of the book is Lust in Translation, The Rules of Infidelity from Tokyo to Tennessee. The author works extensively with the United Nations trying to find out statistically around the world about extramarital relationships. It's a fairly interesting book. The Girl in the Picture. Uh, I don't have a copy of it right here. But um, this book um, chronicles the life story of this woman who in 1975 had napalm dropped on her village by Americans, um, and this book follows, um, there's a researcher who finds her and follows her throughout her life and tells her story. Um, today, she's alive, living in Canada. She has two sons, um, but this book covers her life from birth until now. And it's incredibly important to know where our food comes from. It's one of the only things we put into our bodies. It's the thing that sustains us. It's the thing that gives us life and allows us to continue functioning. Most people are completely unaware of where their food comes from, how it's grown, How it's raised, how it's killed. My views are my own, but I think that everybody should be educated. My opinions are my own, but everybody should be educated. Whether it comes to water, fruits, vegetables, grains, proteins, it's important to know how we get the food we get. Um, it's important to know how much it costs, why the costs are the way that they are. Um, this is a book about the slaughterhouse system in America. From raising animals, feeding animals, keeping animals, killing animals, 
processing the animals, and then the distribution of the meat, and then eating the meat from the very beginning to the very end of the process. My favorite author, Simon Winchester. This man is fantastic. This man can take any topic, the most boring subject, and make it completely fascinating. He wrote a fantastic book about Korea. We don't have it here in the library, but I think we should. This book of his is a history of the first person to make a map in England about rock strata and um, fossils and um, the history of rocks. It doesn't sound very interesting, but he makes it so good. <laughs> Can you think of something worse to read about? What a boring subject. The history of rocks. No, no more than that. The history of a map about rocks. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Another book that I donated to the library. Um, Simon Winchester really can write about anything, and it will make you sit on the edge of your chair just waiting to find out what happens. Um, so, quickly. St. Augustine Confessions. St. Augustine, um, early Christian church, 400s, lives in Turkey. No, it's Herodotus who lives in Turkey. It's Augustine who lives in Algeria. Yeah, sorry, Augustine, North Africa. Algeria, today's Algeria. Um, he is a man. He is a teacher. He works at a school. He teaches students. He has a girlfriend who he loves. He has a child with his girlfriend. They live together. No problem. His mother is a Christian. She does not accept his girlfriend. She does not recognize their child. Um, she tells him that he needs to get married. And, um, and that he should join the church. This is his life story and his process of becoming a Christian in North Africa in the four hundreds. Uh, which is an incredibly interesting time in Christian history. Um, true story that he wrote himself. I, as I said before, I work at Kwangju Women's University, and um, one of the majors that we have at Kwangju Women's University is airline services. We, um, we teach women to become excellent flight attendants. And this book, The Managed Heart Commercialization of Human Feeling, is a book about how emotion becomes a commodity when a corporation or a business wants to sell the idea of warm feelings. It's a, it's, it's a very analytical book. It's a, it's a research book, but it's very good. It's, it's mostly about flight attendants and about the commercialization of human feelings. And those are the books that I wanted to share with you because knowledge is power. Mm. <laughs>